brethren, we are here in the fall festival season and we've been uh, greatly focused on the fulfillment of these days, these festivals, uh, the uh, Feast of Tabernacles uh, and last great day, of course, upcoming, but we've just passed the Feast of, of uh, Trumpets and the Day of Atonement is going to be here in just a few days. And we focus in on these events, and often in, in, in the context of that, we focus in on end-time prophecy and where we stand and what's going on in the world in which we live. And it's appropriate that we do that, because the Bible clearly defines that we are living in perilous times. In the book of Mark, chapter 13, and of course Mark 13 is a parallel to Matthew 24 and Luke 21, Jesus Christ talked about uh, these things. And notice in verse 28 of Mark 13, Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When her branch is yet tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. There are signs when the seasons are getting ready to change. When we're at a point, at a pivot point, seasonally, you can discern that. You can tell there, there are differences. And you notice certain things. And Christ gives this illustration. And he said, In like manner, the same way, verse 29, When you shall see these things come to pass, know that it is near even at the doors. Talking about the events that are going to lead up to his return and to the establishment of the kingdom of God on this earth. Now, he didn't say that, uh, look, there's this little trick formula, and you figure that out, and you know the exact time and day. No, he didn't say that. But what he did say is there are events. There are things that are going to happen. And when you see those things happening, know that you are at a certain point in time, just as you can look and you can see in the weather patterns. You can see in nature the trees budding forth. You can tell that there is a change of the seasons coming, and there is a change of the seasons coming spiritually. Jesus talked about the fact that this generation shall not pass till all these things be done. Now, which generation? Obviously not the generation to which he was speaking, but the generation in whose lifetime these events occurred. The events that Christ was talking about would be things that would not drag out over centuries. They would culminate within the lifetime of a single generation. Heaven and earth shall pass, my word shall not pass. Verse 32, But of that day and that hour knows no man, know not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Now this verse must be a real problem for some of those that think the Father and the Son are the same one. Uh, you know, maybe one half the brain knows and the other doesn't. Or I don't know. It's, you know, the Bible is simple when you take it simply. When you just let the Bible uh, speak for itself uh, rather than get tangled up in, in what various philosophers have, have come up with. So he said, the father, you know, we're told the Father has reserved the times and the seasons into his own power. Christ said that in, in Acts chapter 1, uh, on back in, in uh, Acts 17, where Christ was, to, or where Paul was speaking there on Mars Hill, and he told them that uh, God had determined the times before appointed, the bounds of their habitation. God had a plan and a purpose the rise and fall, the ebb and flow of empires, of great world events, are part of the plan and the purpose of God. So he says, take heed and watch. Take you heed. Watch and pray. You know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house, gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you therefore. You know not when the master of the house comes. At even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Now, the opposite of watch is sleep. The opposite of watch is sleep. He's not talking about, you know, uh, you're sitting there tuned to your, glued to your TV set, uh, watching Geraldo, so you'll know every perversion that uh, anybody has thought of within the last uh, uh, 12 years. Uh, that, that's, not what, that's not what he means to watch, you know. He, he doesn't... Uh, but let's, let's understand a little more. He describes himself as going away on a journey. And he's going to come back. See, he left and he went to heaven. He gave authority to his servants. See, so, there, so there's government, there's structure. You know, some think, well, you know, Christ is the head and everybody else... Uh, uh, well, he gave authority to his servants and to every man his work. We all have our responsibility... He commanded the porter to watch. Now, the porter was there to, to uh, open the door. 
and to bring things. And, and, and you know, when the Master came, He took the, the bags and brought them in. He was there to open the door. You know, generally what, what happened in those days, they didn't have, you know, you come home, you have the key, and you open, the, the, you open your door. Uh, generally what they, what they had, the doors locked from the inside. They fortified, uh, you, you know, slide a bolt into place or something on the inside. And when the, uh, when, somebody, when the master came, somebody had to be in there to open the door. Otherwise, he'd stand there banging on the door, banging on the door, and he couldn't get the door open. And so there was one who was commanded to watch. He said, now, I'm not tell- I don't know exactly when I'm going to be here. I'm taking a journey. I'm going to be back. Watch. Be alert. Because that's what it means to watch. It means to be alert. It means don't go to sleep at the switch. Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. So we're given a responsibility. We are to be... He's given to, all of... He's given to every man his work. You know, Christ said, I must be about my Father's business. We have our work. We have our job. We have our responsibility. We're to be about our Father's business. And we have a responsibility to watch. Now, let's go back to Romans 13. Romans 13 and verse 9. For this, Paul says, You shall not commit adultery. You shall not kill. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet. If there be any other commandment, it's briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, where do you think Paul is quoting these commands. You know, some people scratch their, their head, you know, and say, well, yeah, I know the New Testament talks about keeping the commandments, but which commandment? Oh, you know, all you've got to do is love your neighbor. Well, how do you love your neighbor? Paul says, you do it, and he quotes the last portion of the, of the, uh, of the Ten Commandments. And he quotes various ones of them. And he says, you know, they're all summed up in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. People say, well, see, I didn't say anything about the Sabbath. That's right. Didn't say anything about taking God's name in vain either. I didn't say anything about uh, not worshiping idols. What if thou shalt love if you shall love your neighbor as yourself summarizes these commandments, what brief statement would summarize the first part? You know, when Christ was asked what is the great commandment of the law, he didn't say, Well, love your neighbor as yourself, that's all you need to do. Remember what he said? He was asked the question, What's the great commandment of the law? He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. It's just like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Well, if the last half of the Ten Commandments hang on, love your neighbor as yourself, I wonder which commandments could possibly hang on the first one. Love God with all your heart, soul, and might. That's a perplexing question, you know. I guess uh, the theologians have to go back and consult the Greek on that or something. Uh, try to figure that one out. You know, there is a simplicity to the Bible, if you just read it and take what it says, you don't get into all those convoluted things. It's, it's amazing. So Paul says, this is summarized, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love works no ill to his neighbor. You know, if you really love your neighbor, you're not going to try to hurt him. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is how it all flows together. He's explaining about love and how love flows through the channel of God's law. It is the fulfilling of the law. And then in verse 11, he says that knowing the time, that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. And brethren, if that was true when Paul wrote it, how much more true is it, is, is it right now? You ever stop to think, you know, some of you, as we celebrated the Feast of Trumpets here, for some of you, uh, maybe, uh, you know, different ones have celebrated it for, for different lengths of time. You know, maybe some of you celebrated 20 Feasts of Trumpets, or 30, or 40, or more. You realize that, you know, if you've been around for a while and you've celebrated a lot of, Feast of Trumpets, that undoubtedly the number you have left in front of you is a smaller number than what is behind you. You've already celebrated more. Many of us, many of us in this room have undoubtedly celebrated more in the past than we will ever celebrate in the future between now and the time that that day is fulfilled. We don't know exactly the exact, uh, the exact time, the exact moment, but now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Now, what are we told here? We're told to awaken out of sleep. We're told to 
be watchful. Didn't Christ say that we were to be to, to, to be watchful, to be alert, not to go to sleep, that the porter was not to go to sleep, but we were to be alert and watchful? So it's now high time to awaken out of sleep. The night is far spent. We are to walk honestly or walk decently. If we are going to be awake and watchful, what should we do during that time? So you go to sleep, and, and you have to understand that maybe a lot of what we have gone through of recent date has been a fulfillment of the statement of what, that Christ said, they all slumbered and slept. They all slumbered and slept. Now, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. What are you and I going to be doing? If we're awake, if we're alert, we're, we're watchful, we're, we're on guard, and, and you, you go through some time and do a study, on that word, uh, on that word, watch, because you'll find that it is the same word that is also translated "take heed" in in the New Testament. And that what you know what it means? Uh, it means to to look carefully. It, it talks about take heed to yourselves, lest at any time you be overtaken with all these things. See, to to be alert is the sense of the word. To be conscious of what's happening. Not simply what's happening over in Russia. That's all well and good. But you know, if, if we're not awake and alert in terms of our own lives, what we're doing. You can know every detail of what's happening in world events, but if we're not taking heed to ourselves, to our own lives and what we're doing and how we're putting it into practice, in, in, in how we're putting God's Word into practice in our lives, the way we deal with our neighbors, the way we deal with our husbands, our wives, our children, all the aspects of our life. You see, if that, all of that's involved in taking heed to ourselves and being alert. And we're told that it will... It will reflect itself in the way that we walk. The Bible uses walking because it describes life as a journey. Now, when you and I read of the prophecies of the times in which we live, one of the things that Christ tells us, He says, As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. He describes analogies and parallels between the days of Noah and our times. And when you go back and you read about the days of Noah, one of the things that you find is it was a time, we're told, when violence filled the earth. That was one of the characteristics. It's interesting to just go back and make a list. What are the characteristics? What are, what are we specifically told in Scripture uh, back in, in uh, Genesis 4 and 5 and 6 and 7? Uh, as you go through and you read about the events that led up to and culminated in the flood of Noah, the time that God intervened on a worldwide scale. Well, we're told that it was a time when violence filled the earth. The earth became permeated absolutely filled up with violence. We see that. We see that increasingly around us. We are in the midst of an increasingly violent society. And you, you see that uh, in so many ways. You know, I, I was visiting a couple, uh, visiting a family up in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, back just a couple of days ago. I was up uh, visiting in that area, and, and uh, this uh, elderly lady that uh, I had gone to see, uh, there, the door of her home, uh, looked like, uh, uh, you know, the doors of a, of a jail cell. It was these bars and iron bars, you know, and iron bars on the windows and everything. Well, you know why, of course. Because there's so much violence all over that she locked herself in behind iron bars. There was a time when people in the community in which she lived left the door open so the breeze could blow through the screens at night. The criminals were behind iron bars. Now, the criminals are roaming the streets, and the honest citizens are locking themselves behind iron bars for fear of the people who are roaming up and down the streets through the night. It is a crazy situation in which we live. Violence fills the earth, we're told. We're told that it was a time of increasing perversity, that the imagination of men's hearts was only evil continually. It was a time when things were getting worse and worse. Now... In the context of all that violence, of all that perverseness, of all that craziness, you read there in the book of Genesis of a man by the name of Enoch. And we're not told very much about Enoch, but we're told one specific thing. We're told that Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. You come on down a little later, Noah was the great-grandson of Enoch. We're told of Noah that Noah walked with God. We're told... Peter tells us he was a preacher of righteousness. In the context of all that was going on, here were men who walked with God. That was the way they survived. That was the way they got through. How did they 
protect themselves and preserve themselves. How did they get through the violence? How did they get through and survive all of the perverseness? You know, it doesn't say anything about that uh, Noah and Enoch walked around carrying, uh, you know, a club on each shoulder. They didn't have guns to carry on each shoulder, you know, carry, carry clubs on each shoulder. It doesn't, doesn't talk about, uh, you know, those kinds of things. It, we're told they walked with God and they went through life. And we have testimony of them back in Hebrews 11 that they were men who died in faith, not having received the promises, but they saw them afar off. They were persuaded of them. They were convinced. They embraced them. They held them tight. They walked with God. And we have their record, their story. Brethren, I'm here to tell you that the only way you and I are going to get through the craziness of the world around us, the craziness with which we're surrounded, a world that is deteriorating, that is progressively getting worse and worse. The only way you and I are going to make it through is we're going to have to walk with God too. First thing we have to do is wake up, watch, be alert. But it's more than just sort of standing there with your eyes wide, just, just sitting there. We need to be walking with God. We need to be going about the work that God has given us to do. But if we're going to do that successfully, we've got to walk with God. Now let's get even more specific. How do you walk with God? How specifically? We're all in favor of walking with God. If we weren't, we wouldn't be here. How do you walk with God, specifically, personally, in your own life? You know, the Bible gives us some very specifics of how to walk with God. Let's notice back in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. This is Psalm 119, verse 1. Now, the first way you walk with God is you walk in the law. You walk in the Torah. Now, this word undefiled here is the same word that is translated perfect back in Genesis 17:1. You see, God made a request of Abraham when he offered Abraham a covenant. He said, walk before me and be you perfect. Be completely upright and sincere. Be wholehearted. Walk before me and be you perfect. Be completely upright and sincere. Now, some think, you know, there's some vast difference between what God wanted in the Old Testament and what He wanted in the New. Well, what He asked Abraham, He says, Walk before me and be you perfect. Get back to Matthew 5:48. What did Jesus say? Be you therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Didn't Abraham, wasn't Abraham asked to do the same thing Christ asked us to do? Walk before God and be completely wholehearted, upright and sincere. Be like God. That's what Abraham was asked to do. Be like God. That's what we're asked to do. Be like God. How do you be like God? You can't walk with God if you're not like Him. And you can't walk with Him and not be like Him. You can't walk with God and sort of, you know, drive up to a place and say, well, tell you what, why don't you wait in the car? I'll go in here and I'll be back, you know. Uh, you, you just sort of wait for me, sort of walk with God uh, on occasion. Uh, and, and expect that you can, uh, you know, leave him sitting in the car with the motor running. Uh, and when you, uh, uh, you know, come staggering out of wherever you were, uh, you just sort of take up uh, uh, going with God. Well, it doesn't, doesn't quite work that way. Blessed are the undefiled, the upright and sincere in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. They walk in the law. They walk in the Torah. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies, that seek him with their whole heart. It goes on and it talks about that. And on down verse 9 it says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? How does a young person make changes in his life or her life? By taking heed thereto according to your word. If we let God's word direct us, God's word will change us. It will help us to cleanse our way. With my whole heart have I sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you studied the Bible to make it part of us for the purpose of helping us avoid sin. He comes on down and tells us in verse 24, Your testimonies are my delight and my counselors. I learn from the examples and the illustrations that God gives us. He says in verse 44, I'll keep your law continually forever and ever, and I'll walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. We walk, and if you walk in the law, walking at liberty. Because God's law is... What did James call it? This is New Testament. James called it the perfect law of liberty. It frees us to be like God. You know, sin enslaves us to be like the devil. And it produces sad and sorry results. Well, notice on down a little further in uh, verse 59 here of Psalm 119. 
I thought on your ways and turned my feet unto your testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep your commandments. So he said, I thought about what I was doing. I thought on my ways. I examined. If we study the Bible without stopping to think, and what are we supposed to think on? Well, not just what everybody else is doing. Yeah, well, she needs to change that and he needs to change this. And I don't know how in the world, uh, you know, he, he does so and so. That's not, the, that's not the primary focus. He says, I thought on my ways. I, I thought about what I was doing and I turned my feet. I turned my feet under your testimonies. You know, if you're going to walk a certain direction, uh, it's a good starting point to, to face that direction. You know, you, you walk more effectively when you're, when you're trying to walk the same way your feet are pointed. Uh, you know, you may can manage something else, but it's sort of an awkward, uh, an awkward uh, deal. So I thought about myself. I thought about what I was doing, the psalmist writes, and I turned my feet to your testimonies. I, I faced the right direction. I made haste, hurried up, delayed not to keep your commandments. When you learn something that God wants you to do, you need to be in a hurry to do it. If you know God wants you to do something, then don't see how long you can drag and procrastinate and put it off and sort of hope that maybe He'll change His mind. So, He says, I delayed not to keep your commandments. comes on down and, and describes various things. And... Uh, uh, he talks about in verse 97, Oh, how love I your law. It's my meditation all the day. On down in verse 105, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, God's law. If you walk in the law, you see, it, it points you in the right direction. The, uh, well, we find on down in verse 165, Great peace have they which love your law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, it's interesting, out by... Uh, nothing shall offend them. I have a little number four in my Bible, and I have a marginal note. And uh, in the margin, it says, gives an alternate translation, a more literal rendering of the Hebrew. They shall have no stumbling block. Great peace of they which love your law, they shall have no stumbling block. If you love the law and you're following the law, you're not going to stumble over what other people do or say. See, people can... You know, stumbling blocks can, can cross our paths, and you have a stumbling block. What do you do? You fall down. That's, that's literally what the word offend means, to, to cause to stumble. To cause to stumble. Well, we should not be trying to cause to stumble, but great peace have they that love your law. There is a peace that comes from loving God's way and following God's way. Because you're not going to stumble over what others do or say, because you're not following the way of others. You're following the way of God. You're following the way of God, and so you love God's law, and you're trying to walk in the law. And that's crucial. Let's, let's go back. Let's understand a little more about walking in the law. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 4. Then said the Eternal unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven unto you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. They wanted to see whether they'd walk in the law. He said, now, I'm going to give you manna. I'm going to give it to you six days a week. On Friday, you're going to have twice as much as usual, and none will come on Saturday. So sure enough, you know, Moses explained it, and, and you know, you can just count on it. Uh, sure enough, the Sabbath came, and there were a few hardheads had to go out there. Well, you know, I like mine fresh. And, uh, you know, they're going to go out there, and they're going to get that. And, and no, it didn't come that day. He told you. See, it's not going to happen. But there are people that <laughs> are hard to convince. And God said, I want to prove you. I want to prove you whether you will walk in the law or not. He gave them the law. He said, I want to prove whether you'll walk in it. Well, some did and some didn't. God is still proving us individually, putting us to the test whether we will walk in the law or not. That's what proof means. You know, we tend to think of proof more in an academic sense. Go look it up and, uh, and, and that's fine. That's, that's one aspect of proof. The... Uh, you know, you tell me a word means something, well, I'm going to go, uh, if what you tell me is something different than what I always thought, I'm going to go check you out. I'm going to go uh, maybe look up uh, various sources and see if, if, uh, if what you're saying is, is what agrees with, uh, with others. But the word prove is it's often used in the Bible. You know, it's sort of like the guy that uh, Christ uh, gave the example of, you know, the one that uh, made excuse for coming to the wedding supper, and he said, well, I, I, I've obtained, uh, you know, five yoke of oxen. I've got these new oxen, and I need to go and prove them. Well, he didn't mean he's going to go home, look him up in the encyclopedia, and see if that was really an ox. Uh, you, you know, maybe somebody had sold him a horse and told him it was an ox. Uh, no, he was going to put him to the test. He was going to hitch him up and get out there and plow. 
when God says, I'm going to prove you whether you walk in my law or not, he says, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to put you to the test. I want to see what's really in your heart. I want to see if you want to walk in my way. So we gave them an opportunity to see uh, right there just this matter of the manna. Now, again, I would just bring to your attention, this is before the Old Covenant at Sinai. This is before the Ten Commandments were spoken by the voice of God from Mount Sinai. The Ten Commandments, including the Sabbath, were already in force and effect. This is before they ever got there. You know, God told Abraham, walk before me and be you perfect. And later on in Genesis 26, 5, he told Isaac, he said, you know, I'm giving these blessings to you because Abraham, because of the covenant that I made with Abraham, Abraham obeyed my voice. He kept my commandments. See, that's what Abraham understood it to mean. If you're going to walk before God and be you perfect, you, you did what God said. You obeyed Him. You kept the commandments, the statutes, and, and all those things. See, that's what God told Isaac in, in Genesis 26, 5. So... God wanted to prove whether we'd walk in the law or not. We can come on down uh, further here in the book of uh, Deuteronomy. In De- Deuteronomy chapter 5, uh, Moses restates the, the Ten Commandments here to the generation that's ready to go into the Promised Land, and he uh, describes the, the basis of what God had given as the, as the covenant. And in verse 29, he quotes the words of God, Oh, that there were such a heart in them, that they would... Fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. Verse 32, You shall observe to do, therefore, as the Lord your God has commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the ways which the Eternal your God has commanded you, that you may live, that it may be well with you. You may prolong your days in the land that you shall possess. You're not to turn aside. You're not to get off track. You're to walk in the ways that God has commanded. You're to walk in the law. In the law, if you're going to walk with God, you have to walk in the law. Back uh, earlier, you see there's an alternative to walking in the law. And uh, that alternative is given uh, on over here a little further in the book of Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy 29. And uh, let's notice on down that uh, here we have in De- Deuteronomy 27, 28, 29... Uh, we have this section uh, called the blessings and the cursings, cause and effect. And God describes the miracles and the things that he had done. And he told them that uh, uh, in verse 29 that they were to keep the words of, the cov- of this covenant and do them, that they might prosper. And uh, uh, on down a little, bit, a little bit further, he says uh, in verse 16... You, you dwelt in the land of Egypt, and you saw, and, and we came through the nations. You, you came through these various nations, and you've seen their abominations and their idols, and you, you know what they do. Lest there be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turns away this day from the Lord our God to go and to serve the gods of these nations. Lest there be among you a root that bears gall and wormwood. And it comes to pass when he hears the words of this curse, that he blessed himself in his heart, saying, I shall have peace, though I walk in the imagination of my heart, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, as the uh, margin renders it in some of the other translations. I think the New King James renders it that way. Though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, to add drunkenness to thirst. See, there are those who say, yeah, I know, but I'm going to do it my way. I want to do it God's way. See, you either walk in the, way, you walk in the law... Or you walk in the stubbornness of your heart. People look around and they see what all the various, uh, various religions and various customs. Well, you know, I want to do it this way. What defines the pathway that we travel through life? Is it the law? Or is it just our old hard head? Well, let's come on down a little further. Uh, over and over, this is reiterated. David told Solomon that back in 1 Kings 2. Uh, when uh, he told Solomon, he says, you know, I go the way of all the earth. David was ready to die, and he knew that. He said, I go the way of all the earth. He says, told Solomon, he said, uh, you know, be strong and show yourself a man. You've got responsibility ahead of you. And then he told him to walk in the ways of God. Walk in the ways that God had commanded. And obey God and do those things. Well, let's, let's come forward. Let's look at the book of Ezekiel. Here we read something that uh, actually has a, a future time setting. It's talking about the people of Israel, and how God will regather them. He talks about in verse 19 of Ezekiel 36, I've scattered them among the, among the nations. I've scattered them among the heathen. They were dispersed through the countries. But then he says, 
in verse 24, I'll take you from among the nations, and I'll gather you out of all the countries, and I'll bring you into your own land. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and you'll be clean from all your filthiness and all your idols will I cleanse you. He's talking about a time not merely of regathering the people and regathering Israel, not just the Jews, and a time when he's going to clean them up. Now, that's not the regathering of the Jews to the nation of Israel here in the 20th century. They haven't been cleaned up and converted. Most of them don't even make a pretense of following their own religion, much less uh, uh, the full Bible. That was not even the situation when the Jews came back under Zerubbabel or any other time. They very quickly got off track, and there were a lot of attitudes. No, he's talking about a time, verse 25, I'll clean you up. Verse 26, a new heart also will I give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh. I'll put you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them, and you'll dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers, and you'll be my people, and I'll be your God. I'll put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. If you're converted and have the Spirit of God and are led by the Spirit of God, that will lead you in the paths of obedience to God. There are those that think that having the Holy Spirit means that you don't need to obey the law. Well, if you've got the Spirit of God, I'll put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. God's Spirit will lead you in the law. It'll lead you in walking in the law. If you want to walk with God, you have to walk in the law, not in the stubbornness of your heart. The Apostle John expressed it in the New Testament in 2 John, 2 John verse 6. This is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So... We're to walk in the commandments. We're to walk in the law. If we're going to walk with God, we must walk in the law, not in the stubbornness of our heart. That is crucial. Now, that's not all there is. If you're going to walk in the law, then there's something else that has to be done. We have to walk in the light that radiates from God. The whole way of God. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. This is a familiar section of Scripture that we often read at this time of year. Undoubtedly, you'll hear it read at the Feast of Tabernacles. Isaiah chapter 2, in verse 2, It shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Eternal's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. Many people shall, come, shall go and say, Come you, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us of His paths. We will walk in His paths going to follow God. Out of Zion shall go forth the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He'll judge among the nations. They'll beat their swords into plowshares. On down in verse 5, O house of Jacob, come you and let us walk in the light of the eternal. Now the people of Israel were told, Therefore you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, full of divinations from the east, all caught up in all this, this eastern occult, mystic uh, uh, sort of stuff, which is really the, uh, the origin of what is termed a new age. There's nothing particularly new about it. It's just another brand of the old Babylonian mystery religion, you know, of which there are uh, various brands all go back to, to, to the uh, original source. Uh, but there have been all sorts of things from the East, all these uh, sort of mystic uh, uh, occult uh, religions and, and, and mystic uh, uh, forms of, that come from the Buddhists and the Hindus and various uh, religions that come out of the East. And so we see that increasingly, that there is a, people are fascinated by that. And they're looking to something that comes out of darkness. They're not following the light, they're following darkness. Some of those places where, where these kinds of things originate, you know, the so-called great wisdom of the East, while well, you're looking at some of the most backward, uh, the most poverty-stricken, the most disease-ridden, the most, uh, uh, some of the poorest, most messed-up places on the face of this earth. What's the great wisdom of the East done for the East? What, what has it done for the lives of those poor people? Their religion has enslaved them to superstition and demonism. You know... Their religion is meant that the cow walk down the street eating the produce and poor people sat there starving, not daring to offend the cow who may actually be grandpa in disguise. You know, what great wisdom of the East. You've forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they'd be full of divination from the East. They're soothsayers, astrologers like the Philistines. They please themselves in the children of strangers. They're looking here and there. They're searching in darkness. And God says... 
Come, Jacob, O house of Jacob, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Walk in the light. There is a radiance that comes forth. God's Word is a lamp. It's a light. We're to walk in the light of the Lord. It will enlighten our pathway in a world of darkness. The whole world lies in darkness under the rule of the evil one. Notice back in 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. John writes in verse 5, This then is the message which you have, we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have fellowship with Him and we're walking in darkness, you can't walk with God and walk in darkness. You know, you can't walk with God and walk in the stubbornness of your heart. If we're going to walk with God, we have to walk in the law. If we're going to walk with God, we can't walk in darkness. We have to walk in the light. We must walk in the light as He is in the light. God is the source of light. It absolutely radiates out. You know what it's going to be like when God Himself comes down here to the earth? Back in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, tells us. Describes, you know, in the beginning of Revelation 21 about the new heavens and the new earth. The new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven. And it talks about that in verse 14, that the wall of the city has twelve foundations. We're told in verse 16 that the city lies four square. We're told in verse 21 that the city has twelve gates, that each gate is a pearl. Twelve gates were twelve pearls. The streets of the city are pure gold, almost like transparent glass. And in verse 22, I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them that are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, and for there shall be no night there. No night. Because the glory of God will lighten it. You know, if we were in here and the lights were all turned out and... and, and it was darkened from outside. It'd be pretty dark in here. If I pull down a little flashlight, it would make some light. And you think, well, you know, we can see a little bit now. If all of a sudden you turn on the lights and open the window, open the curtain, the little light that my flashlight put out wouldn't, you, you wouldn't even be able to tell hardly that the thing was on. It would be so overwhelmed and dwarfed by the amount of light that comes from all the other. Well, we think the sun's pretty bright. When God is here, there will be such brightness and brilliant radiance that will be emanating out, you know, if you're out in the, in the dark and you've got a little candle out there, that's putting out some light and you can see a little bit. Take it out in the bright noonday sun and set it out there and, and uh, see how much light you get from it. You, you won't even notice it's there. That's the comparison. God is a source of light. And light radiates. If we're going to walk with God, we have to walk in the light. The light that radiates out from God and we are given God's Word as a source of light. Let's go on. Let's notice a little further if we're going to walk with God. Let's go back to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. Because if you're going to walk with God, you must also walk in newness of life. You've got to walk in the law. You've got to walk in the light. You've got to walk. Notice what we're told here in Romans 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death. Therefore we're buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. If we've been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His resurrection. Baptism is an outward symbol of something. There's a reason why we're not sprinkled or poured on or something of that sort. We are immersed in water. You are buried in a watery grave. That is a likeness of something. That is symbolic of a death, burial, and a resurrection. Because we are baptized for what the Scripture calls the hope of the dead, which is the resurrection. Just as Jesus Christ went into the grave and He was raised up by the power of the Father, came forth in power and glory... He's going to return, and we will be glorified with Him. When we're baptized, we go through that in faith, in anticipation. 
See, symbolically, you know, Christ talked about in John 3, except you're born of the water and of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom. What we go through at baptism is symbolic, and we anticipate ultimately being born of the Spirit. God uses water as a type of the Spirit. But you have to be born of the Spirit to emerge into the very family of God, a glorified spirit being. But we go into a watery grave, and we come up, come forth. And so he says we're buried with him in baptism. We've been planted in the likeness of his death. It was typical of that. And we come forth as a type of the resurrection, so we should walk in newness of life because we are saying by being baptized that we have faith and confidence the time is going to come when we will enter the family of God when we will truly be born again, born of the Spirit, born into the very Spirit realm to live life with God. And so we must walk in newness of life because we're looking forward to a new life, a life without end, a life that's not simply based on a temporary chemical existence. We walk in newness of life if we're going to walk with God. Now, to walk in newness of life means we can't go on being just like everybody else. We can't be just like the world around us. Leviticus chapter 20. See, in verse 7, we're told, Sanctify yourselves therefore and be you holy, for I am the eternal your God. What God has always desired for His people is for us to be like Him. Why would God want to do away with His law? You know, you think God wants to be like us? <laughs> I mean, it doesn't make sense. God says, hey, I'm right. I've lived this way for all eternity and it works. And I want to give you a chance to share in it. And you can live for all eternity with me as a part of my family. But if we're going to live in harmony, we're going to have to live the same way of life. And my way works. Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be you holy, for I am the eternal your God. And so he comes on down and he talks about... Uh, I'm giving you this land, verse 24, giving you to possess a land that flows with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God, which have separated you from other people. You don't have to be just like everybody else. You don't have to blend in and be part and parcel of this world. Verse 26, you shall be holy unto me, for I, the eternal your God, am holy. I've severed you from other people that you should be mine. We're to be different than just like the world. Notice in verse 23, you shall not walk in the manners of the nations which I cast out before you or in the customs of the nations. You're not to walk in the customs of the nations. No, we're to walk in newness of life. We've been called to be part of a kingdom that will endure forever on into eternity. We have been called to be part of the kingdom of God to inherit that kingdom. And so we have to walk in newness of life. We can't be like the world. Don't walk in the customs of the nations. Don't follow, well, you know, the, the world does this, and, you know, that's sort of a nice little custom. And, and uh, uh, you know, we'll take it and sort of Christianize it a little bit. I'll put uh, angels on my Christmas tree rather than Santa Clauses, and so that'll make it all right. Christ back in Christmas. He never was. So you can't put him back in something where he never was. I guess you can put Nimrod back in it or, or something. He, he uh, one started it out. You know, God says, look, Don't turn to the right hand or to the left. Walk in my ways. Walk in newness of life. Don't walk in the customs of the nations. Don't try to blend in with this world and be part and parcel of it. You know, the people of God need to be different. I don't mean in some sort of of, of oddball way, but we ought to be a peculiar people. We ought to... The changes we make in our lives ought to be changes that are directed at helping us be more like God and not just blend in with the society and fit in with this world. We're to walk in newness of life, not in the customs of the nations. Let's go on. Let's look a little further. Psalm 86. You see, we're to walk in the law, walk in the light, walk in newness of life. We're also to walk in the truth. Psalm 86, verse 11 tells us, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I will walk in your truth. The truth is something that must be walked in. The truth is not just something to have as an academic list of doctrines. Well, I believe this and I believe this and I'm I'm right about that. and I'm ready to argue with somebody and prove my point on this. The truth isn't something that you just use to beat other people over the head with or to sort of put yourself up. Well, I know more than he does. The truth is something that is to be lived. It's to be a part of us. Walk in the truth. Back in 3 John... Third John, let's notice in verse 3, Jesus, or John writes, 
For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, even as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. To walk in the truth. John talked about the truth being a way of life. We walk in the truth in the contrast, of course, to walking in the truth. Just walk in falsehood, to walk in lies. Back in Jeremiah chapter 23. I tell you, God gives a strong indictment here in Jeremiah 23. Verse 1, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, says the Lord. Woe be. That's serious business. Now, you know, when you read it in context, the word pastor and shepherd are, are synonymous in Hebrew and in Greek, both the same term. Uh, it's rendered pastor sometimes and shepherd sometimes. And when you go through in the context, I understand that this involves an indictment against the national leaders of Israel that will culminate ultimately in David, uh, King David, verse 5, being set up as the uh, uh, being set up. But if it applies to, if God takes seriously the fact that the leaders, the pastors, the shepherds of physical Israel have led them astray, how much more seriously does he take it when the pastors of his people, spiritual Israel? have led them astray. Woe be to the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people, you've scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Well, guess what, God says? I'll visit you. Uh, you didn't visit them. I'll visit you. I'll visit upon you the evil of your doings. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where they've been driven, and I'll bring them again to their fold. God says, I will take care of that, and I will set up shepherds over them that will feed them. God's going to do that for the nation. He's going to do that in the world tomorrow, the world ahead. God's also in the process of doing that now for His people that have been scattered. God goes on, and He talks about these things in all of the... Uh, uh, Verse 11, He says, Both prophet and priest are profane. In my house have I found their wickedness. Wherefore, their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. Now, if you've ever gotten on a slippery slope when the dark, you know you're in trouble. It's bad enough to hit a slippery slope when you can look around and see. But when you're in the dark and you hit a slippery slope, that would make a good spokesman's club tongue twister, wouldn't it? Slid down the slippery slope. The uh, Well, God says that the whole slew of false prophets are going to slide down the slippery slope. And he says they're going to it, the slippery ways in the darkness. And they'll be driven on and fall therein. I'll bring evil upon them, God says. I've seen the folly, verse 13, of the prophets in Samaria. And I've seen, verse 14, in the prophets in Jerusalem, a horrible thing. They commit adultery. They walk in lies. They walk in lies. They walk in falsehood. They're not teaching the truth. They strengthen the hand of evildoers so that none returns from his wickedness. They're all unto me as Sodom and the inhabitants of Gomorrah. So God says he's going to deal with that. He talks about those who walk in lies, walk in falsehood. Brethren, if we're going to walk with God, we've got to walk in the truth. We've got to walk in the truth. Now let's go on. Let's look a little further. Let's go back to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah describes something, a situation, that when you understand it is really the background for Malachi 3. Because Malachi was the prophet of God who was contemporary with Ezra and Nehemiah. You remember Malachi described a situation when he said the whole nation is cursed with a curse? They were in dire straits economically. And he says, why? He says, you're cursed with a curse. For you robbed me, even this whole nation. So ultimately there was a spiritual root to their problems. Nehemiah is dealing with the physical aspect of the problem. In Nehemiah 5, verse 1, he says, there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against their brethren the Jews. They said, Our sons and our daughters are many, and we take up corn for them that we may eat. We've mortgaged our, our lands, verse, thir verse 3. We've mortgaged our land, vineyards, and houses that we might buy corn because there's a drought. See, they weren't being blessed by God, and there was drought and, and all sorts of problems, and people were so desperate they'd even mortgage their homes in order to, to buy food. Verse 4, we borrowed money for the king's tribute and had to mortgage property in order to do that. And so what had happened was those who had money there in Judea were taking the mortgages. They were loaning money and charging interest. Here were people who were trying to keep from starving. And here were others who said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. You, uh, you, you say your kid's pretty hungry over there. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll loan you some money. Uh, and, and here, and, oh, you can't pay? Well, I'll tell you what, I'll take your house as collateral. And they had actually 
wound up and utilized this thing. Here were, were corrupt individuals, greedy individuals, who were using it as a situation to just sort of soak up all the property and to further impoverish the people. Now, there were spiritual problems. Malachi addressed that. But Nehemiah tied into the ones who used their wealth as an, as an, as an opportunity to just sort of choke out the poor people who were destitute. Nehemiah in verse 7, I consulted with myself, and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers. And I said unto them, You exact usury every man of his brother. And I set a great assembly against them. And uh, verse 9, Also I said, It is not good that you do. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? Because of the reproach of the, of the nations, our enemies. Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God? See, that was the problem. They, didn't have, they weren't walking in the fear of God. If we're going to walk with God, we have to walk in the fear of God, in the reverence and awe of God. If you really walk in the fear of God, you're not going to treat people that way. That's what Nehemiah told them. If God is really real to you and you realize that God is looking down and He sees what you're doing and He hears what you're saying, you're not going to live like that. You're not going to treat people that way. You're not going to take advantage of somebody and just sort of squeeze the, the life out of them. Not if you stand in, in fear of Almighty God that you're going to have to stand before Him and give an account. As Jesus said, "...inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me." Boy, if that's real to us, brethren, it will transform the way we live our lives. We'll walk in the fear of the eternal. People get ready to do something. They sort of look over their shoulder, you know, see who's listening, who's, who's watching. See whether they're close enough to hear. You, know, you really want to look to see who's listening. You look in the wrong direction. You need to look up. We want to know who's watching. You don't look over your shoulder. You look up. We need to walk, our, we need to walk in the fear of the eternal. Walk in the reverence and awe of God. Walking in the fear of God doesn't mean you're hiding over in a corner, a sort of quivering because God's going to get you. But it means that God is real. God is real and you're, we live our lives in awe and reverence of the power and greatness of God and the real, realization that we're ultimately going to stand before God and we walk in the fear of the eternal. And that's vital. You see, if you don't walk in the fear of God, what do you walk in? You know, Nebuchadnezzar, there was a time that Nebuchadnezzar didn't walk in the fear of God. You remember the story back in, in Daniel chapter 4? Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? And he learned a lesson. God struck him down, and he wandered seven years like a wild animal, a raving lunatic. Until all of a sudden, at the end of this time, his possession of his faculties came back to him. And Nebuchadnezzar wrote a letter. And a portion of that letter is preserved right in the Bible, in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 4. Daniel, Nebuchadnezzar said, You know, I've learned that the Most High God rules in the affairs of men. I've learned that. Daniel 4.37, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose words are truth in His ways, judgment, and those that walk in pride, He is able to abase. Boy, Nebuchadnezzar learned that the hard way. You walk in pride, God can abase you. He can bring you down. Do we walk in the fear of God or do we walk in pride? If we're going to walk with God, we have to walk in reverence and awe of Him being far more impressed with God than we are with ourselves. See, Nebuchadnezzar was impressed with himself. And he learned the lesson, you know, God is the one before whom we live our lives. We're going to walk with God. We walk in the law. We walk in the light. We walk in newness of life. We walk in the truth. We walk in the fear of the eternal. And let's notice the sixth way that we walk with God. We walk in love. Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 1. Be you therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love, as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. If we're going to follow God, then we have to walk in love. Now, the opposite of walking in love doesn't just mean that you walk in hate. It can just as easily, in fact, more likely, the opposite of love is simply indifference. If we're going to be followers of God, we walk in love. That means that there is a genuine outgoing concern and caring. We don't go through life simply indifferent and uncaring to what others are going through. If we are indifferent, that's not walking in love. If we're going to walk with God, we must walk in love. The love of God flowing in and out from us. Now, that doesn't mean that you can fix everybody and everything because you absolutely can't. And I think we all know that. Hopefully we do. 
doesn't mean that you take responsibility for everybody else's conduct and their choices and their decisions and somehow you can do something and fix them. But it does mean that we do care and that there is a willing to help as we're able. You know, the Scripture tells us, as we have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially to them of the household of faith. There is an attitude of caring, of outgoing concern, of genuine love for others. To love our neighbor as ourselves. To love one another, to love the brethren fervently, with a pure heart fervently, as the Scripture says. So, if we're going to walk with God, we have to walk in love. Jesus Christ lived his life manifesting outgoing concern. If we really genuinely love, we're willing to give of ourselves. It's not a selfish, self-centered approach, but an outgoing, caring concern. And let's notice one final way, a seventh way in which we walk with God, is we, if we're going to walk with God, brethren, we must walk by faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says simply, for we walk by faith, not by sight. He's going through and talking about the fact of his desire to to be in the kingdom of God, to to shed him, to, to be rid of this this mortal physical body and have it replaced by a glorious spiritual body that will no longer get sick or tired, won't have allergies, uh, won't have uh, fatigue, it won't get hungry, will be a glorified body. Paul says we walk by faith, not by sight. You see, if we're going to walk with God, ultimately we have to walk by faith. Our confidence can't be based on what we see with the around. People look. And they think, well, you know, we, we've got our protection. We, we'll build up these, uh, these great arsenals. And, you know, it talks about the nation, our nation. I don't care the, the armaments. You know, we're going to find that, that armies aren't going to deliver in the day of the Lord. You know, the things that, that the nation has put its trust in. You go through and you read the prophecies. You read about economic collapse. You read about... Uh, a total breakdown of law and order, tumults in the midst, as it talks about in the book of Amos. You read about, ultimately, famine, starvation, disease epidemics. Science and technology is not going to deliver man in the day of the Lord. Not with superior weapons, not with with, uh, new ways of of staving off disease or, or famine. You see, ultimately, you read about back in the end, back in Revelation, Revelation 6 and various other places, you read about individuals who have stored up uh, gold and guns to protect themselves and to ensure their security. You know what's going to happen? It's going to turn radioactive and they're going to, in the midst of all these explosions, they're going to throw it to the moles and the bats. It describes that back in the book of James, uh, how that, uh, let me just read it to you uh, briefly. Uh, James 5, verse 1, Go to now, you rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. You have heaped treasures together for the last days. But God says you haven't treated others fairly, and those that work for you, you didn't even pay them. You took advantage and oppressed others to build it up. And he says, it's going to be witness. You've eaten these treasures for the last days. It's going to eat your flesh as it were fire. You, you ought to go through and read a little bit. Gold specifically has a, a special property uh, of absorbing radioactivity and becoming uh, highly radioactive when it's, when it's exposed uh, in, a, in a very unique way. And so gold does not normally, uh, you know, it doesn't rust, it doesn't decay, but it does turn radioactive. Uh, and, and, and it absorbs. There's, I, I don't, uh, uh, can't go through all the, uh, the, the chemistry of it in terms of the periodic table and some of the, the special properties, but, but it's, an interesting, it's an interesting thing. And, and God singled that out, and He says, you know, the time's going to come. You read in, in, in Revelation 6 about when the day of the Lord comes and all these things are happening. And people start throwing it, you know, trying to get rid of this stuff. And they're trying to hide from the great God. People... Humanly, every single one of us, all of us as human beings, we like to put our trust in what we can feel and touch and see and what can be measured and discerned by the physical senses. That seems somehow more real to us. But brethren, the times through which we're living, the times ahead of us, are not going to be times when we deliver ourselves. You see, in the days of Noah, what was the solution? You know, there was only one boat that survived the flood. Do you think there was only one boat on earth? 
Oh, I'm sure there were other boats. There wasn't one just like the one Noah built. But there were other boats. And everybody had their laugh, old Nutty Noah out in the middle of the cornfield building a boat. Ha, ha. Not a cloud in the sky. Yeah, I guess he thinks it's going to rain. Well, you read, the time came. Noah and his family entered in, the animals entered in, and were told God sealed the door. God sealed the door. See, God's the one that determined when time was up. He sealed the door, and the lightning flashed and the thunder rolled, and it poured for 40 days and 40 nights without let up. And in the meantime, great earthquakes were opening up, giant fissures in the earth, and great uh, geysers were, were spewing up water from subterranean depths. And for 40 days and 40 nights, it stormed and it raged. And at the end of that time, water prevailed over the whole earth, and Noah and those on the ark survived. Now, I don't know how long some other people made it in whatever boats they had, or which guy was the last one. You know, uh, who was the last guy to drown? I don't know. But he drowned, nevertheless. It may have taken him a few more days than some of the others. You know, there was a way to escape all that. That was to believe Noah, who was a preacher of righteousness, and to walk with God, to walk by faith. When you walk by faith, God is there. And you're walking with God. To walk by faith is to walk with God, to walk hand in hand with the great God. David says in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. He didn't say, well, I fear no evil. I'm a big, tough guy. Nothing scares me. No, he said, I'll fear no evil, for you are with me. When you're walking with God, you have the source of the greatest confidence that there is. We have to walk by faith and not by sight. If we're going to walk with God, if we're going to walk with God, we must walk in the law. We must walk in the light of God. We must walk in a newness of life, not in the customs of the nations, We have to walk in truth. We have to walk in the fear of God, not in pride and vanity. We must walk in love, and we must walk by faith. And as we do that, brethren, we are going forward. We must be alert and awake, and we must walk with God. And as we do, we are in anticipation of the time when all the world will come and say, Let us go up to the mountain of the house of the Lord, that He will teach us of His ways. We want to learn how to walk with God. The season we're celebrating, brethren, is a time that celebrates when you and I will be there with Jesus Christ, walking with Him for all eternity and ready to reach out and show all nations how to walk in the ways of God.